Well, hello everyone. I'm back with a new series of videos covering chapters of Geography, Class 11, NCRT. Chapter 2 Structure and Physiography. This is an important chapter, and the reason I say that is because if you understand this chapter, let me re emphasize this again. If you understand this chapter, you will answer many direct as well as indirect questions in exam. In this chapter, we will go a bit deeper in terms of concepts. So stick along with me, and you will not regret spending your time watching this video. With no further ado, let's begin. In this picture, you can see the various form of our Earth, how it was 250 million years ago, and then it changed drastically. So this is the present day. Now, I want you to look at the position of India. There you go. We don't have India over here. Similarly, in 145 million years ago, we were still not there. Even 65 million years ago, we were not there, but we are here. So how did this happen? Now, I want you to closely look at Australia. So this is Australia. Just, just have a look at it. So 65 million years ago, this was Australia. So now closely look at it. This 65 million years ago, this Australian plate, it broke into two parts. And then the Australia is a separate plate now and India got freedom out of it. Let's say that way. And we got associated with Asia and that's how we were formed. So when India got associated with Asia, there was a huge land collision, which we also called it as plate tectonics or continental drift. So with these endogenic and exogenic forces, there was a lateral movement of the plates. That's why you can see all the present day geological structure and geomorphological process active. Now based on the variations in its geological structure and formation, India can be divided into three geological divisions. These are the peninsula block, the Himalayas and other peninsula mountain and the Indo Ganga Brahmaputra plain. Now the peninsula block extends up to this much. That's it. Nothing beyond that because the Himalaya was initially not part of India. It was formed as a result of when India got associated with Asia, there was a huge land collision and due to which Himalayas were born. Now this is the Himalayas and the other peninsula mountains. So this much was formed due to the land collision. It was not there initially. This is the Indo Ganga Brahmaputra plain. So the Indus river flows this side. And this is the Ganga tributaries. They all flow this side and fall into Bay of Bengal. And the Brahmaputra comes from China, enters in India and again flows into Bay of Bengal. This region is a plain, you see. And this is because of the running water carrying all the soil from one place to another. Therefore forms a huge plain. So that is how this plain came into existence. And when we put all three together, this is what it looks like. On top we have the Himalayas and then we have the IGB plain, which is Indo Ganga Brahmaputra plain. And at the bottom we have the Peninsula Plateau. Now that we learned about the geological division, let's move on to physiographic division. So in physiographic division, India is broadly divided into the northern and northeastern mountain. Then we have the northern plain and then we have the peninsula plateau. Then we have the Indian desert and then we have the coastal plains and finally the islands. Coming to northern and northeastern mountains, we have the Himalayas. The Himalayas consist of a series of parallel mountain range. So as you can see, we have the middle Himalayas and then we have the great Himalayas and the Shivalik range. So that was all about the mountain ranges that exists in Himalayas. Now we'll talk about the different types of Himalayas. We have the Kashmir or Northwestern Himalayas and then we have the Himachal and Uttaranchal Himalayas, Darjeeling and Sikkim Himalayas, Arunachal Himalayas and then Eastern Hills and Mountains. Let's get to know the Kashmir or Northwestern Himalayas. Just have a look at Kashmir Himalaya on map. So Kashmir has few ranges and a cold desert which together forms Kashmir Himalayas. So the ranges are Karakoram range, Zaskar range and Peer Panjal. Whereas there is one cold desert called Ladakh. So remember this one point, Kashmir Himalayas are also famous for Kareva formation, which is useful for the cultivation of Zafran. It's a local variety of saffron. There are some important freshwater lakes such as Dal Lake and Wula Lake. And then there are some saltwater lakes such as Pangkong So and So Moriri. So these two are Chinese because of the name of it. They come from China in India region. The Kashmir region is drained by the river Indus and its tributaries are Chelam and Chenab. These two only flow in Kashmir. The other three goes in Punjab. The Kashmir and Northwestern Himalayas are well known for their scenic beauty and picturesque landscape. Now there are a few famous places of pilgrimage such as Vaishnadevi, Devi, Amarnath Cave, etc. So this is all about Kashmir and Northwestern Himalayas. Coming to the next part of Himalayas, it is the Himachal and Uttaranchal Himalayas. It lies in between the Indus and the Ganga tributaries. The British colonial administration were attracted and some of the important hill stations such as Dharmshala, Masuri, Shimla, Kasani and cantonment towns 
were developed here. The valleys are mostly inhabited by the Bhutia tribes. These are nomadic group who migrate to Bugyals. The places of pilgrimage such as the Gangotri, Yamunotri, Kedarnath, Badrinath and Hemkund Sahib are also situated. The third part of Himalayas is the Darjeeling and Sikkim Himalayas. It lies between Nepal Himalayas in the west and Bhutan Himalayas in the east. It has a fast flowing river called Tista. It is a region of high mountain peaks like Kanchanjunga. The valley is inhabited by Lepcha tribes. It has a mixed population of Nepalis, Bengalis and tribals from central India. The British took advantage of the physical conditions such as the moderate slope, thick soil cover. They introduced tea plantation in this region. Let's move on to the Arunachal Himalayas. They lie in between east of Bhutan Himalayas up to Dipu Pass in the east. Some of the important mountain peaks of the region are Kungtu and Namcha Barwa. Rivers like Brahmaputra, which are fast flowing rivers from north to south, they form deep gorges. Some of the important rivers are the Kameng, Subansiri, the Dihang, the Dibang and the Lohit. The valley is inhabited by Monpa, Abor, Mishmi, Nishi and the Nagas. Most of these communities practice Jhuming. It is also known as shifting or slash and burn cultivation. Coming to the last part of the Himalayas, they are the eastern hills and mountains. They are known by different local names. In the north, they are known as Patkai Bam, Naga Hills, the Manipur Hills and in south, as Mizo or Lushai Hills. The Barak is an important river in Manipur and Mizoram. Loktak Lake at the center, surrounded by mountains from all sides. It is also one of the important lakes. Most of the rivers in Nagaland form the tributary of the Brahmaputra. While two rivers of Mizoram and Manipur are the tributaries of the Barak River, Barak itself is a tributary of Meghna. The rivers in the eastern part of Manipur are the tributaries of Chindwin. Moving on to the next feature, the Northern Plain. They are formed by the alluvial deposits brought by the rivers. It's plain and simple. When the running water took all the soil with itself and deposited at, at a different place, hence forming a large bed of alluvial deposits forming the Northern Plain. Okay, the three main rivers causing the formation of the Northern Plain is the river Indus, Ganga and Brahmaputra. The length of this plain extends approximately 3200 km from east to west and the average width of these plains are from 150 to 300 km. From the north to south, these can be divided into three major zones, the Bhabar, the Tarai and the Alluvial Plains. Now let's read a little bit about Bhabar. Bhabar is a pebble covered belt. So you can see it's fully consists of pebbles, stones. The width of it is 8 to 16 km and it lies parallel to the Shivalik slope. All the stream disappears into the belt. It is natural. When the water comes to the pebble covered belt, it is bound to disappear. Second comes the Tarai. South of the Bhabar belt lies the Tarai belt. This belt was originally covered with thick forest. Hmm. So after the stony slope, you have the thick cover forest, which was cut down for cultivation. Then comes Bhangar and Khatar. These both are the subdivision of alluvial soil. So Bhangar is the largest part of the plain. It is covered with rich alluvial soil. The Bhanga presents a terrace-like feature. So it has these terrace sort of a thing for cultivation. Next comes Khadar. The Khadar belt is made up of new deposits from the rivers. The soil is renewed often due to the flow of river. We have read this again and again that when water moves from one place to another, it renews the soil. This belt is ideal for agriculture. Brahmaputra river flows from northeast to the southwest direction. Uh, the mouths of these mighty rivers also form some of the largest deltas of the world like Sundarban Delta. These river valley plains have a fertile alluvial soil cover which supports a variety of crops like wheat, rice, sugarcane and jute and hence supports a large population. With this we have finished the northern plains and till now we have finished two topics the northern and the northeastern mountains plus the northern plains. Let's move on to the third topic the peninsula plateau. The peninsula plateau have an elevation of 600 to 900 meters. It starts from Delhi Ridge in the northwest to Raj Mahal Hills in the east and then Gir Range in the west and then Kardamam Hills in the south. I'll just show you all of this point on a map. Here it is. The peninsula plateau is the oldest and the most stable landmass of India. Elevation of the plateau is from the west to east. That's why many rivers flow towards east. So as we so we know that the west this is the western ghats and this is the eastern ghats. So this side of the plateau is higher in elevation than this side. That's why most of the rivers flow this side into Bay of Bengal. The western and northwestern part of the plateau has an emphatic presence of black soil. So this part we are talking about the western part and the northwestern part which is this side the Gujarat and Rajasthan side this is full of black soil so the peninsula plateau can be divided into three broad groups and they are the Deccan plateau the central highlands and the northeastern plateau let's read about Deccan plateau it lies in between western ghats in the west and eastern ghats in the east and the Satpura 
Maikal Range and Mahadeo Hills in the north. Western Ghats are comparatively higher in elevation and more continuous than the Eastern Ghats. Anaimuri, the highest peak of Deccan Plateau followed by Dota Beta on the Nilgiri Hills. Most of the peninsula rivers have their origin in the Western Ghats. Some of the Eastern Ghats rivers are Mahanadi, Godavari, Krishna and Kaveri. The Eastern and the Western Ghats meet each other at the Nilgiri Hills. Now let's read about the Central Highlands. So it is bounded in the west by Aravari range and to the north it is bounded by Satpura range. In the eastern extension of the Central Highland is formed by Rajmahal Hills that is near Jharkhand to the south of which lies a large reserve of mineral resource in the Chota Nagpur Plateau. This region has undergone metamorphic process in its geological history. W what do you mean by metamorphic? So there are three types of rocks right? Sedimentary, igneous and metamorphic. So the transformation of rock with excess of heat and pressure over the time is called metamorphic process. Metamorphism is the change of rock to its physical shape with extreme heat and pressure by the presence of metamorphic rocks such as marble, slate, knees, etc. So these are the three common metamorphic rocks that are found in this region. Coming to the third type, the northeastern plateau. Due to the force exerted by the northeastward movement of the Indian plate at the time of the Himalayan origin, a huge fault was created between the Rajmahal hills and the Meghalaya plateau. I'll show this to you on a map. How it was formed. Later, this depression got filled up by the deposition activity of numerous river. Today, the Meghalaya and the Karbi Anglong Plateau stand detached from the main peninsula block. Meghalaya Plateau is also rich in mineral resources like coal, iron ore, sillimanite, limestone, and uranium. With this, it brings to an end of Peninsula Plateau. Moving on to the next topic, the Indian Desert. To the northwest of the Aravali Hills lies the Great Indian Desert. The desert can be divided into two parts. The northern part, the sloping towards Sindh and the southern part, that is the run of Kutch in Gujarat. Low precipitation and high evaporation makes it a water deficit region. So that was all about the Indian Desert. It was a very brief topic compared to others. Moving on to the next topic, the coastal plains. So the coastal plains are divided into two parts, the western coastal plain and the eastern coastal plain. Let's read about the western coastal plain. The western coastal plains are an example of submerged coastal plains, that means underwater. Because of this submergence, it is a narrow belt and provides natural condition for the development of ports and harbours. Kandla, Mizagaon, Jalan Port, Navahashewa, Marmagao, Mangalore, Cochin, etc. are some of the important natural ports located along the west coast. The western coast may be divided into following divisions. The Kutch and the Kathiawar coast in Gujarat, Konkan coast in Maharashtra, Goan coast and Malabar coast in Karnataka and Kerala. Western coastal plains are narrow in the middle and get broader towards north and south. The rivers flowing through the coastal plains do not form any delta. Coming to the eastern coastal plain, the eastern coastal plain is a broad and is an example of an emergent coast. There are well developed deltas here formed by the rivers flowing eastward into the Bay of Bengal. The continental shelf extends up to 500 km into the sea which makes it difficult for the development of good ports and harbours. Now let's quickly look at a comparison between the western coastal plains and the eastern coastal plains. So the western coast plains are an example of submerged coast plain and the eastern are an example of broad coast plain. It is believed that the city of Dhaka, which was once a part of the Indian mainland situated along the west coast is submerged underwater. That's a quick trivial fact for you. And then on the eastern side, there are well developed deltas here formed by the rivers flowing eastwards into the Bay of Bengal. Deltas are nothing but small uh, landforms which are formed at the mouth of the river when they when they touch the sea or ocean. Kandla, Mazagaon, Jalan Port, Navasheva, Marmagaon, Mangalore, Cochin Port are some of the important natural ports located along the west coast. Now on the eastern side, these include the deltas of the Mahanadi, the Godavari, Krishna and the Kaveri. So with this we have come to an end of another topic, the coastal plains. Moving on to the last topic, the islands. So we have two places where the islands exist in our country. One is at Bay of Bengal which consists of 572 islands and the other is in Arabian Sea that consists of 36 islands. So let's read about the Bay of Bengal islands first. It has Andaman in the north and the Nicobar in the south. They are separated by a water body which is called the 10 degree channel. It is believed that these islands are an elevated portion of submarine mountains. Well, submarine mountains are peaks or group of peaks rising from the ocean floor. However, some smaller islands are volcanic in origin. Baran Island, the only active volcano in India is also situated in the Nicobar Islands. The coastline has some coral deposits and beautiful beaches. These islands receive convectional rainfall and have an equatorial 
material type of vegetation. Coming to the set of islands in Arabian Sea. The islands of Arabian Sea include Lakshadweep and Minikoy. They are located at a distance of 280 km to 480 km of the Kerala coast. The entire island group is built of coral deposit. Minikoy is the largest island with an area of 453 square km. The entire group of islands is broadly divided by 11 degree channel, north of which is the Amini Island and to the south of it, Kananur Island. With this, we have come to an end of chapter 2. It was a long and a crucial chapter. I hope you found this informative. If you like the video, consider giving it a thumbs up and leave a comment below. And make sure you are subscribed. You'll get an alert when my next video comes. Or if you want me to make anything specific, do let me know.